The title of this presentation is Where Are We Going? This is actually the second part in a two-part series. Uh, the first one was done in London called Where Are We Now? which dealt with the financial system and other attributes you might be familiar with if you follow the work that I do with the Zeitgeist Movement, which is the activist and communication arm of another organization called the Venus Project. More on these organizations as we go along. Part one, evolutionary baggage. Roughly 10,000 years ago, the human species stumbled into a new social paradigm, which is now referred to as the Neolithic Revolution. During this time, it appears we began a transition from predominantly egalitarian societies consisting of hunters and gatherers to an agricultural revolution where deliberate cultivation of food replaced the more passive finding of food sources, hence allowing for much more control over production. At the same time, there also seems to be a major push in the advancement of what we call technology today. Stone tools were advancing, which eventually set the trend for the Bronze Age, which used the forging of more malleable copper, and then the Iron Age, which enabled more strength, so on and so forth. I think we know all these patterns. Since this period, we can look back and recognize a constantly increasing rate of technological development. In fact, it appears to be an exponential increase. This graph here, made by Ray Kurzweil, shows an exponential increase of the mass use of inventions, specifically communication technology, computer technology, and the like. Next to it is another chart which shows a history of technological invention and the amazing rate of progress in general. I think it is safe to say that this evolution of technology, and hence science itself, has been and continues to be the fundamental catalyst for progress and change. It is by far the primary factor driving the development of human civilization, not only in the facilitation of achieving specific ends, but also in the more subtle manifestation of our belief systems, philosophy, frames of reference, and essentially how we interpret the world around us. The scientific method itself is a form of technological tool, and its application has continually advanced our understanding of the world around us, facilitating constant change. Unfortunately, cultural beliefs Beliefs um, that we all share, traditions, are very rarely in tandem with the socially progressive nature of science and technology. This is termed culture lag. This stems from social identifications with existing traditional values and established institutional practices. These emotional identifications, and I apologize for this graphic, but I couldn't resist. <laughs> These emotional identifications are a source of comfort for us. In fact, I have an anecdote. Uh, when I was coming here from the airport, I saw the Amish. They have evidently lived nearby, and they were driving on the street. It was nighttime. What did they have? They had electric lights on their horse and buggy. I'm like, hey, that's cheating. <laughs> the thing is, is that it's really difficult for any traditional establishment to really keep moving forward without eventually giving in to the beauty of the advancement of technology and what it can do for us. As a classic example of this phenomenon, which I'm sure many of you have heard before, was when the Italian physicist astronomer Galileo first presented evidence to the political institution of his time and region regarding the Earth revolving around the Sun. He was met with deep threat and deep opposition by the political religious establishment, for it was very much contrary to their religious texts and hence traditional identifications. In fact, the Inquisition banned the reprinting of Galileo's works for 76 years after his death. The reality is institutional establishments, meaning institutions of both traditional codified thought and institutions with societal influence and power, meaning, meaning philosophy dogmas on one hand and corporations and governments on the other, each have a high propensity to engage in denial, dishonesty, and corruption to maintain self-preservation and self-perpetuation. The result is a continuous culture lag, where social progress by way of incorporating new, socially helpful scientific advancements is constantly inhibited. It is like walking through a brick wall, as the established power orthodoxies continue to perpetuate themselves for their own interests and comforts. Now, to illustrate this phenomenon in a modern context, let's examine one of the oldest established orders still in use today the monetary system. 
when I say the monetary system, I don't, I don't mean native monetary policy, interest rates, the fractional reserve policy, central banks, or any other component attribute. I refer to the absolute foundation of the concept being a system of incentive, acquisition, and exchange. So first, let's ask the most fundamental question. Why did we invent money? Contrary to the attitudes of most of the world's population today, money is not a natural resource, nor does it represent resources. Money is actually a social convention for managing scarcity and rewarding creation. If a person grows a food product on a plot of land, that product is given a value one based on how scarce the product is in the region, hence the level of demand versus supply, and two, along with the amount of labor and time spent to produce that product. Generally speaking, if a product is rare in the society, then its value is raised. If the skill set needed by a person to cultivate that product is also rare in the community, then the value is increased as well. This is the basic theory of value, which you'll hear in Economics 101. As innocuous as this may seem on the surface, let's now consider some of the unspoken negative retroactions of this system, namely the profit mechanism and its relationship to establishment preservation. Very simply, problems and scarcity equals profit. Socially negative attributes of society become positively rewarded ventures for industry. The more problems and scarcity there is, the more money that can be made off of attempts at solutions. The more efficiency created in society, the less opportunities for monetary acquisition. Think about this. In other words, and this might sound rather pessimistic and abrupt, but there is very little intrinsic reward and hence motivation to solve any currently profitable problem in existence. The very nature of monetary reinforcement condones the perpetuation of problems. For example, energy is the cornerstone of our society. You would think that scarce um, and depleted oil supplies, which is a common speculation at this point in time, peak oil, would be a dire concern given our current social dependence, posing nothing but negative connotations. No, not in the short term. There is nothing the oil companies want more than consistent scarcity. The 2007-2008 speculative bubble in oil, which shut down schools, school buses, and caused immense hardship for the lower classes uh, for both home heating and transportation, is a classic example. If oil companies know that they can make more money by having their items scarce, the propensity to deliberately limit production and disregard social concern or simply be dishonest outright about available resources is very high. The same goes, unfortunately, for every other socially dire problem, such as environmental pollution. The more polluted our water tables and taps become, the more industry can compensate by offering profitable solutions. This creates a perverse reinforcement of indifference to environmental concern by industry. For the more damage there is, the more money that can be made. It is simply how the game is set up, and the psychological ramifications are sick and profound. Let's consider the medical industry, which should be one of the most altruistic and progressive institutions we have, as our quality of life often depends on it. However, we need to realize the simple reality that the medical establishment, with its millions of employees, thrives off of the sickness of the population. The more problems solved in the realm of disease, the less money that can be generated. For example, the cancer industry. This is a massive, uh, multi-billion dollar a year industry, a trillion dollar industry, with a very large number of people in employment. Suppose for a moment, hypothetically, that a cure for all cancers was somehow achieved, and the method of treatment was simple and easy. In other words, there was no longer a way to make all of this money off of the illness by the medical establishment. Do you realize what would happen to the economy, to the medical institutions, if that particular problem was actually given a viable solution? And when you realize that, do you really think that the intent is to cure this illness? It's something to think about. And it would also lay off tens of thousands of people. I mean, keep in mind, it's an establishment. 
the moment you have employees and everything, and even if you're working initially for an altruistic cause, the moment you're in the position of supporting a group and the group relying on the institution, suddenly motivations change. As another example, what if a company made a car that could last 80 years without service and also runs without the need for perpetual refueling through battery technology? The aftermarket value of that car would be virtually zero and billions of dollars would be lost due to the now obsolete consumer oil and auto service market industries. I'm sure many of you know that we have the technology now to create electric cars um, that can go 80 miles an hour for a thousand miles on one charge. Uh, you might also know as a case in point that the White House during the Bush administration, which was in fact the oil cartel in power, made sure their corporate constituents in the oil industry were safeguarded against this new reality by helping to just get rid of the idea of itself, squashing it. In fact, there is no reason why every single car sold could not be electric right now. They aren't because social progress and human well-being is always second to monetary gain. I'll say that again. Social progress and human well-being is always second to monetary gain. Also, if people cannot make money off of solving social problems, they simply will not be done. Take a look, the, look, take a look at the horrid, dire destitution in Africa, or simply the rampant and growing homelessness across the world. I think George Carlin actually put it best. Have you ever noticed that the only metaphor we have in our public discourse for solving problems is to declare war on it? We have the war on crime, the war on cancer, the war on drugs. But did you ever notice that we have no war on homelessness? You know why? Because there's no money in that problem. No money to be made off of the homeless. If you can find a solution to homelessness where the corporations and politicians can make a few million dollars each, you will see the streets of America begin to clear up pretty damn quick. <laughs> Most when they think about these kinds of things, the word corruption comes to mind. Most feel that these are ethical issues. But is it really corrupt for an energy, energy establishment to want to limit supply artificially so they can make money? Is it really corrupt for a company to seek indifferent self-preservation at the expense of social progress? Actually, no, it isn't. It is simply business as usual, and this is what I'm trying to point out. And you should expect nothing less than this tendency. The profit mechanism creates established orders which constitute the survival and wealth of large groups of people. The fact is, no matter how socially beneficial new advents may be, they will be viewed in hostility if they threaten an established, financially driven institution. Meaning social progress can actually be a threat to the establishment. So, to put it into a sentence, abundance, sustainability, and efficiency are the enemies of profit. Progressive advancement in science and technology which can solve problems of inefficiency and scarcity once and for all are, in effect, making the prior establishment's servicing of those issues obsolete. Therefore, in a monetary system, corporations are not just in competition with other corporations. They are in competition with progress itself. That is why social change is so difficult within a monetary system. In other words, the established monetary system refuses free-flowing change. You really, you cannot have a social convention where money is made off of inefficiency and scarcity and expect a quick incorporation of new advents which can relieve those problems. I know I'm drilling this in, but uh, most do not see this, and I want to make sure it is perfectly clear. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on the monetary system because, as I mentioned, it was the focus of a prior presentation. However, I would like to quickly point out two important issues. The first is the economic reality that the entire global economic system is based on what I call cyclical consumption. The only way the system can work is if money is perpetually circulating. Money must be continuously transferred from one party to another in order to sustain so-called economic growth. This is done through constant or cyclical consumption by virtually everyone in society. 
jobs are entirely contingent upon demand for production in some form. If there was no demand for goods and services, then there would be no demand for labor and financial circulation would hence stop. What this translates into again is that inefficiency equals profit. The entire system demands problems for it to work. Not, this is not only paralyzing, as we have discussed, but it also creates outrageous amounts of resource waste, irrelevancy, and extremity. The second point I would like to make on this issue, which is much more broad, has to do with the holistic nature of the monetary game in historical practice and the fundamental intent. All societies today, whether termed capitalist or socialist or even communist, are fundamentally based on money. Money is the enabler of possibility within the system itself. Free market capitalism, as it is often called, is now the dominant economic religion of the day. I say religion because when it comes to the cultural perception of this methodology, few today seem to have the ability to even ponder any other options for social operation. They are fully indoctrinated. The free market in practice can be defined as a market in which supply and demand are unregulated except by a country's competition policy and rights in physical and intellectual property are, are upheld. You'll notice it says unregulated except by the country's competition policy. In other words, there is no such thing as a pure free market. And I know m most of us know this, but I want to make the point for nor could there ever be such a thing as a pure free market without the system despotically self-destructing beyond repair. Why? Because the basis of free mar the free market pursuit, meaning the self-interest based pursuit and strategic acquisition of market share, the gaming strategy, can only lead to monopolies and cartels. That is, that is the basis of the entire motivation. And it's funny how economists today will deny that up and down. For example, let's say I want to open an, an electronics store in a relatively small town, say here in Fairfield, Iowa. And at that time, there are three other stores in this same area, and therefore, I have to compete with them. As time moves forward, I work to streamline my competitive strategies and reduce overhead in such a way that my store becomes the dominant, most affordable distributor of a certain set of items, and everyone in the town flocks to my store over the others for such items. Due to this, two of the other three stores go out of business and leave town. So at that point, it is just my store and the uh, other competitor in the region, dual competition. Now, since my profits have been so good, I make an executive decision. I decide to attempt to acquire or buy the other competing store in town. Seems reasonable, right? Acquisitions happen all the time. And they agree. So I purchase that store, put my logo on it, and boom, I have a regional monopoly. Likewise, let's assume I didn't purchase the other store, but rather just became friends and in turn partners with them. And we figure out a way to work together and flourish in a non-competitive way. Seems logical, right? Well, guess what? Now I have a cartel. In other words, business is based in part on a gaming strategy to win market share and hence profit. Therefore, it is a natural gravitation to seek dominance in your sector or industry. And the highest level is monopoly and cartel. It is a natural progression of the free market system to become as dominant and powerful as possible. But it doesn't stop there. And I'm sure most in this room understand the practice of congressional lobbying by corporations, considered absolutely normal. Well, what is financial lobbying? Lobbying is the prostitution of the state to grant further powers or positions of ease to corporate industries. In other words, if you pay off a few congressmen to support your company's agenda, then you have further secured your position economically. The same thing goes for campaign contributions. Now, people say that's corruption. No, it's not. It's the free market at work. What else do you expect? There is no such thing as an, there is no such thing as an objective government in a monetary system. It is impossible. The whole society is based on money and income, so why do you think any lines would ever be drawn and respected? We see this BS ethic argument all day long, and guess what? It has never worked. It never will work. Influence and hence corruption is a natural byproduct of our system. It should be expected. In fact, let's take this train of thought even further. Throughout history, there has been one empire after another, each working to secure global land and resource domination. 
The central reason for war is for resources, profit, empire power, and trade monopolies. Governments are fundamentally no different in function than corporations when it comes to self-interest. The United States invasion of Iraq could be considered a hostile corporate takeover in effect, for even the most naive individuals today know it had nothing to do with weapons or freedom or democracy for the people. I, I don't even want to belabor that issue for it's just considered passe to even talk about it. It's not even in style. We're so used to this level of corruption that we just look the other way these days. However, I do want to clearly point out what war really has to do with if you have any inhibitions. It is for the conquering of resources, industrial profit, and empire expansion fundamentally. In the words of two-time Congressional Medal of Honor recipient Major General Smedley D. Butler, war is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope, and it is the only one where the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. Now, it's important to point out that today the pursuit of profit in the market system is generating a different form of empire, a corporate empire, based on merging economies through trade agreements. It's called globalization. I think Jim Garrison, president of the State of the World Forum, put it quite succinctly. Taken cumulatively, the integration of the world as a whole, particularly in terms of economic globalization and the mythic qualities of free market capitalism, represents a vertible empire in its own right. Few have been able to escape the structural adjustments and conditionalities of the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, or the arbitrations of the World Trade Organization. Those international financial institutions that, however inadequate, still determine what economic globalization means. Such is the power of globalization that within our lifetime, we are likely to see the integration, even if unevenly, of all national economies in the world into a single global free market system, hence empire. To put it gesturally, the propensity of the system is to create world monopoly. That is the gestural natural gravitation of the methodology and philosophy of the free market ideology itself. That is what the psychology sets up. I hope that's clear. It is based on strategic domination, and I think it's time people finally awaken to this. It isn't based on freedom, it's based on conquering. The core basis of social functionality in our society is inherently despotic. There is no such thing as an ethical transaction. Again, ethics and competition are incompatible. For the basis of seeking differential advantage for personal gain is wholly unethical in any civilization, leading perpetually to conflict and exploitation. Dishonesty is the mode of operation at every level, whether you realize it or not. And frankly, how anyone in their right mind could ever rationalize that a balanced, peaceful, sustainable, and productive world could ever come out of open competition, hence open warfare, from individuals competing against each other for work, to corporations battling each other for market share, to governments competing against each other for global economic dominance, is beyond me. We live in a paralyzing, detachment-promoting, self-serving system which generates parasites and prostitutes. Each one of us, due to the very nature of the monetary game, is forced into a position of submission, either to an employee or employer, excuse me, or a client. The basic goal is monetary acquisition, not service to social progress. We leech and exploit. Sadly, the only cooperation you'll tend to find these days or actually ever since the system was created, was when there was a common enemy, meaning when a particular group works to fight against another, hence one corporation working to fight against another corporation. Advantage is dishonesty. I hope everyone thoroughly understands that. Moving on. I would like to address some other culturally common attributes of modern society, both institutional and ideological, which are rarely thought about in a holistic sense. This is going to be a little bit abstract, but I would like to show how the integrity of these current conventions are either outdated, polluted by the monetary system and self-interest, or are simply ignoring the root causes of the problems which these conventions are attempting to solve. The four points are, 
One, laws, rights, and paper proclamations. Two, security. Three, government as we know it today. And four, activism and so-called ethics. Laws, rights, and paper proclamations. In society today, government attempts to control human behavior by way of threat in the form of laws. Little regard is given to the reasoning behind causes for these so-called criminal acts or socially offensive acts. If a person is arrested for stealing, very little regard is given to the environmental conditions that generated the interest to steal to begin with, the motivation. Is a mother who steals food to feed her starving family a criminal? No. She's simply doing what she has to do. When we reflect on this reality that we as human beings are really nothing more and nothing less than animals and operate with the same basic behavioral reinforcement, and again, sorry for this graphic, but I had to use it to make the comparison. <laughs> the fact is we operate with the same basic behavioral reinforcement, survival tendencies as most other species. We see then that it is illogical and irresponsible to consider any human behavior outside of the realm of the social condition. In the early 90s, a study was done called the Merva Fowles study, which found that a 1% rise in unemployment in major US cities resulted in a relatively substantial increase in crime. This shows how so-called criminal behavior is directly related to the socioeconomic circumstances. It should be no surprise that the great majority of people in prisons come from deprived socio socioeconomic positions. Excuse me. Society is producing the behavior, particularly scarcity, if you pay attention. And year after year, the number of people in prison rises, along with the number of laws on the books. Therefore, obviously, something isn't working, right? Something is not working. Something is wrong. If society was progressively managed with the intent of collective human well-being, then we should be seeing a constant decrease in crime and prison populations, a decrease in laws. In fact, the goal of a productive, stabilizing society would be the intent to eliminate the need for prisons, police, and everything we have just mentioned altogether. I think um, Lisa Simpson put it best. And that's the drunk tank, and this is Mommy's desk. Mom, I know your intentions are good, but aren't the police a protective force that maintains the status quo for the wealthy elites? Don't you think we ought to attack the roots of social problems instead of jamming people into overcrowded prisons? Look, Lisa, it's McGriff, the crime dog. <laughs> this brings us to the concept of security now. Since 9-11, security measures across the world have gone berserk with irrationality. The public at large, especially in America, is now neurotically obsessed with security. The solution to violent human behavior is evidently more police, more cameras, and less freedom and liberty. I hate to break it to everybody, but uh, if somebody really wants to kill you, or blow up an airplane, blow up a shopping mall, or or do anything they want, essentially, in the form of violence. Release toxic gas in the subway. They will find a way to do it. No form of security will ever stop that. Therefore, the logic is wrong. It is impossible. And the whole basis of security as we know it is the absolute reverse of the application that's required to solve these types of issues. True security comes from solving social problems addressing the environment and reasons, or the neuroses and distortion of the human being. This is a chart covering the last 200 years. The y-axis shows life expectancy, and the x-axis shows income adjusted for inflation. Each bubble is a country. The size shows the population, and the color shows the continent. The uh, key is in the top right-hand corner. You will notice that in 1800, life expectancy was under 40 years of age in all countries, and income was less than $3,000. Now, what I want you to pay attention to is the trend of disparity, particularly in income, as we view this chart through time.
you will notice that life expectancy has basically risen along with uh, wealth in general. But what do we see mostly? What do we see? What stands out? We see a tremendous and growing economic disparity. Africa, for example, is just left in the dust by the Western nations. We went from this to this. Economic disparity is obviously growing. Now, why am I bringing this up? There is some research that's been done by a few parties, one being Richard Wilkinson of the University of, of, the University of Nottingham in the UK, which has shown a strong correlation between crime and income inequality. Not absolute income, but inequality itself. It's psychological. For example, in the United States, which has the largest income gap in the world, hmm, I wonder why we, oh, of course, we're also the wealthiest in the world. I wonder why we have the largest prison population in the world. Why is there so much distortion? It's possibly because of this tremendous economic stratification. Here is a chart showing the growing disparity uh, divided into the upper and lower classes. While the lower classes stay poor on average, the gap between them and the upper and middle classes continues to grow extensively. I believe this is the basic source of the increase in crime across this planet holistically. There seems to be a correlation between growing disparity in prison population and hence crime. The more income inequality, the more crime. It comes from what some people refer to as psychosocial stress. So coming back to my original point, when it comes to the concept of security, I think one of the most important things we should be considering is reducing the global income gap. In other words, I think that the more this inequality in the world grows, the more world conflicts that will arise on multiple levels. Okay, now we're going to move on to paper proclamations. Today we use paper proclamations, as we call them, to denote a person's so-called rights. And just like laws, they are culturally biased, artificial concoctions, which attempt to solve reoccurring problems by simply declaring something with words on paper, usually. Rights, in fact, have been invented to protect ourselves from the negative byproducts of the social system itself. And once again, instead of seeking a true solution to a problem, we invent these patches by way of paper proclamations in an attempt to resolve them. This does not work. It has never worked. There is really no such thing as an unalienable right outside of the culture in which it is assumed. We are making this up. Therefore, liberties need to be inherent in the social system by design, not alluded to ambiguously on paper. As a classic example of this, let's take the notion of divine law, the famed Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not murder. Why? These are surface notion cop-outs created by men who didn't have any real information, who did not understand that we live in a cause and effect reality. Telling people this does virtually nothing, as, as history has proven. Morality is an empty idea that has no empirical referent. An intelligent commandment would be something like, Thou shalt continually reorient thyself and society to reduce reactionary propensities that lead to aberrated consequences such as stealing and murder. <laughs> that would be a genuine statement. The same surface irrelevancy applies to any constitution or bill of rights of any country on this planet. In the Bill of Rights of the United States, there is an attempt to secure certain freedoms and protections by way, again, of mere text on paper. Now, while I understand the value of this document and the temporal brilliance of it in the context of the period of its creation, that does not excuse the fact that it is a product of social inefficiency and nothing more. In other words, declarations of laws and rights are actually an acknowledgement of failures of the social design. There are many people today in the so-called patriot and liberty movements. I know many people like this. I'm a fan of many people who are proponents of this, in part because I think there's a place for it. But this document is not the savior of America. Some people seem to believe that the United States had some magical position at one point or another, perhaps where we slaughtered all the Mexicans and Indians to steal the land, or the fact that when the Constitution was written, only white 
property owning males, which is about 10% of the whole population of the nation, could actually vote. This is government by the people. Moving on, let me demonstrate what I'm talking about here. The Fourth Amendment details how people have protection from unreasonable searches and seizures. This statement is basically qualified by the termed notion of probable cause in the amendment. What is probable cause? The only way to figure this out is to find a legal working definition that is culturally accepted. A common definition of probable cause in this context is a reasonable, reasonable belief that a person has committed a crime. Okay, so the qualifier is now reasonable, right? Reasonable, okay, this is often defined as fair, not excessive or extreme. Well, okay, then I guess we have to move on to the word excessive. You see my point, I hope. It is meaningless semantically, therefore it cannot be trusted. None of them can. In other words, legal definitions are not empirical. All the amendments are subject to the whims of interpretation, which is why they are abused by the police, Homeland Security, and the IRS on a daily basis. Therefore, back to my original point, there is no such thing as rights, as the reference can be altered at will. The Fourth Amendment is an attempt to protect, protect people from state power abuse. That is clear, but it avoids the real issue, and that is, why would the state have an interest to search and seize to begin with? How do you remove the mechanisms that generate such behavior? We need to focus on the real cause. Now, to be clear again, I'm not saying that laws, rights, and the like are not needed at this time. They certainly are. But we need to hone our focus to resolving the actual problem. And by the way, for all the nationalists out there, I am not attacking the U.S. Constitution once again. However, it is not the answer, and it's naive to think that this document really has that much relevance. Again, I am a fan of people like Ron Paul and Dennis Kucinich. I believe there's a place for the work that they do, but it's not the answer. The history of America is just like the history of any other country on this planet. It is a history of deception, fraud, and corruption. There is nothing to return to, for the integrity was never there to begin with. We must move forward, not backwards. And this brings us to government. All governments in existence today, whether you recognize it or not, are institutional dictatorships. They are publicly sanctioned power monopolies. And democracy as it is practiced today is simply a game that is played, I'm sorry, but it's simply a game that's played to give the public the illusion of control. People think they have choice in our current system because they can press a button on a voting machine and put a pre-selected person into power. However, once that person is in power, the public then has virtually no say. Did you vote for the bank bailout? Oh, no. No. Did you vote for the cabinet of a new president? Did you vote for the tax increase? Do you vote for where highways or power grids or any infrastructure goes? Did you vote for the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq? No, you didn't. So where is your real participation? In part three, we will discuss how a true democracy actually would work, and it's not the election of people, it's the election of ideas. We have to understand that government as we know it today is not in place for the well-being of the public, but rather for the perpetuation of their establishment and their power, just like every other institution within a monetary system. Government is a monetary invention for the sake of economic and social control, and its methods are based on self-preservation first and foremost. All a government can really do is create laws to compensate for an inherent lack of integrity in the social order. It's also worth pointing out that most politicians, in fact, are lawyers. Most players in government come from the world of law. And in reality, they have absolutely no real education, therefore, or understanding about the true foundation of social operation. Can a lawyer come fix your home heating system? Can a lawyer go and organize a power grid for a particular area? No. Lawyers and hence politicians are simply not trained in any tangible way to solve real problems. They're trained to solve artificial nonsensical problems that are culminated byproducts of our nonsensical society. 
In other words, society is in fact a technical creation. I'll say that again. Society is a technical creation consisting of infrastructure, resources, and management. Society is a technological construct. Republican, Democrat, it doesn't mean a damn thing. If you really want to see a society that works, you have to begin to realize that science and technology is the overarching element that governs the entire mechanism of social organization. And therefore, those who study those attributes should be given not control, but should be given the forefront of participation, forefront of influence to say, hey, you know, we can feed and clothe all the impoverished people in Africa and in the third world. We could technically do it. But unfortunately, they go to their corporate bureaucracy, and hence government bureaucracy. And of course, the government say, oh, we don't have the money for that. The question has never been, do we have the money? The question has always been, do we have the resources and technological know-how? Now, the final issue I would like to cover in this section <clears throat> has to do with activism and the traditional patterns of activism we have seen historically across the world. In the world today, there are countless well-intentioned people and activist organizations making a lot of noise about the rampant problems and injustices in our world. Yet, unfortunately, as you tend to find, very few offer any real tangible long-term solutions. Those that do offer solutions, however, almost universally frame those solutions within the pre-existing social establishment. Their tactics tend to involve new legislation and of course, they always demand ethics and accountability. Very little regard is given to the root structure of our system. Battling and protesting corporate organizations, corrupt corporate organizations, and seeking money from society in an attempt to curtail such trends is a typical path that is taken. It is a very respectable path in general. However, it is not going to create long-term change. I'm nothing but pleased to see something like this but does that really do anything? When it comes to social corruption, poverty, environmental disregard, human exploitation, and most personal and social turmoil in the world today, the great realization is that most of these problems are not the result of a particular company, some nefarious elite group, or some government legislation. These are symptoms of the foundational problem. The real issue is human behavior, and human behavior is largely created and reinforced by the social patterns required for survival as necessitated by the social system of that period in time. We are products of our society, and the fact of the matter is, it is the very foundation of our socioeconomic system and hence our environmental condition, which has created the sick cultural climate you see around you. Very rarely do any activist organizations today consider the possibility that maybe it is the social system itself that is the problem. The bottom line is that we can spend the rest of our existences attempting to stomp on the ants that mysteriously wander out from underneath our refrigerator, setting traps or laws, or we can get rid of the spoiled food behind it, which is causing the infestation to begin with.